In this video, we're going to quickly introduce the idea of electric flux, why it's defined the way it is and how to compute it. Then we're going to look at the electric flux through closed surfaces and derive Gauss's law, which says that the flux through a closed surface depends only on the charge contained within that surface, no matter the size or shape of the surface. Finally, we're going to look at our first application of Gauss's law, which is to calculate the electric field inside and outside a uniformly charged spherical shell. So we begin by introducing the idea of electric flux. And in our picture here, we see a patch of area that we call A and a uniform electric field with field lines that are poking through the area A. The main geometric idea here is that we're counting the field lines that pass through A, and that's the electric flux. And we usually give that the symbol capital Phi. Now the orientation of this surface is described precisely by making use of a normal vector. And that's a vector perpendicular to the surface with unit length, and we usually call that n hat. And we see that in this case, our normal vector makes an angle of theta with the direction of the electric field. And to be clear about our area as a vector, a vector is just the magnitude of the area a with the direction given by n hat. So a vector is equal to that magnitude a multiplied by n hat. So the main idea of electric flux is that we want to quantify how much electric field is passing through a given surface. In other words, how many electric field lines are penetrating this surface. And like so many formulas in physics, we can get a good definition of flux from some basic reasoning about proportionalities. First, surely the flux should be proportional to the size of the area patch, since doubling the area doubles the number of captured field lines. Second, the flux should also be proportional to the electric field strength. In other words, doubling the electric field strength doubles the density of the field lines passing through the area element, so we capture twice as many field lines for the same area A. Finally, the flux also depends on the angle between the area patch and the electric field. If we rotate our area patch until it's parallel to the field, then no field lines are going to pass through the area element, and we get zero flux. Alternatively, an alignment perpendicular to the field would maximize the number of captured field lines and maximize the flux. So to quantify this statement about orientation, we use the normal vector to make a precise mathematical statement. If theta is the angle between the normal vector and the electric field, then the flux is maximized when theta is zero and minimized when theta is 90 degrees. And this means our flux is proportional to the cosine of theta. Finally, putting all three of these properties together, we arrive at a good definition of electric flux. And that's phi equals E times A times the cosine of theta, but this could also be written as a dot product, the electric field vector dotted into the area vector, remembering that the area vector is just the area multiplied by n hat, and that dot product is just taking care of the cosine function. So this formula is valid, provided the electric field is constant and the surface is flat, and has only one unique orientation, so the normal vector is always pointing the same direction. But it's not hard to adapt the definition of flux to a tiny infinitesimal patch of area that we call dA. Provided this area patch is truly infinitesimal, that guarantees E is a constant and n hat is a constant in the flux calculation, because the area is so small that there's no room for E and n hat to change over that infinitesimal surface. So we apply our flux formula to this infinitesimal case and we arrive at an infinitesimal flux contribution of d phi equals e dotted into dA, where again the direction of dA is the direction of the normal vector at that particular location. And now we can work on writing down the flux through an extended surface S. So there's our extended surface, and we've visualized a little patch of area on that that we call dA, and we've shown the local electric field at that particular location as well. And now that we have an expression for d phi, we can simply add those up by using integration. So we can say that our total flux is the sum of all the d phi's. That's the integral of d phi. Each of those d phi is given by an e dotted into a dA for all the different locations over the surface. So let's work an example of an electric flux calculation. And this example is actually going to pay off for us later when we get to Gauss's law. In the example, we have a single point charge of plus Q, and we're interested in computing the electric flux through a spherical surface with radius R and Q at the center. So we already know that electric field lines emanate radially from this charge. And as these pass through the surface, we can see in our little area element dA that the field lines are parallel to the normal vector, in other words, perpendicular to the area elements, since the dA's are tangential to the surface while the field is radial. So we can write down our total flux here as the integral of E dotted into dA. 
but the dot product is trivial here. The angle is zero, so we just get the product of magnitudes E times dA. Now we realize that the electric field magnitude is constant over this entire surface, since the entire surface is located at a fixed distance of r from the point charge, so we can pull that constant electric field out of the integral. Now we can plug in the formula for the electric field generated by a point charge at a distance of capital R, and we still have to compute the integral of dA over this sphere, but that really just says add up all the area contributions over an entire sphere, in other words, it's the surface area of a sphere of radius capital R. So we can plug in 4 pi r squared for the area of the sphere. And now we see that a bunch of stuff is going to cancel out. We can cancel a 4 pi and an r squared. And when we simplify, we find that our total flux simplifies to q over epsilon 0, where epsilon 0 is the primitivity of free space. And this is actually really close to being Gauss's law already, but we still need to make three crucial generalizations. First, we need to see that the flux through the spherical surface does not depend on the size of the sphere. And this is actually already clear from the result that we got, q over epsilon zero. There's no r in that formula, so the flux will be the same regardless of the radius of the sphere. To argue it a little bit differently, we're looking at two different spheres with q at their centers, and we focus on a little bundle of field lines passing through the smaller inner patch of area, dA1, and we see that the field lines spread out at the same rate the area patch grows to dA2 as we project onto the larger sphere. So dA1 and dA2 capture the same number of field lines, and doing this over the surface of the whole sphere gives the same total flux result. To be a little more quantitative, we can say the area of a sphere is proportional to the square of the radius, but the electric field generated by a point charge is inversely proportional to the square of the radius, so when we compute the flux, those r's are going to cancel out, and we get a flux result that doesn't depend on r. Okay, so the size of the sphere doesn't matter. Now we need our next generalization, and this one might be a little surprising at first. It actually turns out that the flux through any closed surface containing this point charge plus q will turn out to be the same result q over epsilon zero, regardless of how convoluted the surface might be. Now the purely qualitative argument for this does make some intuitive sense, we're really saying that at some point, every field line emanating from Q must penetrate the surface because it's a closed surface. So shape doesn't matter and we get the same flux regardless. But we really should get more quantitative than that. So we're going to show that this works with a reasonably rigorous argument. So our closed surface S is curvy this time, sort of a potato shape in our picture. And we've highlighted an area patch on S with some electric field passing through it and we can see that the normal vector is not parallel to the electric field this time. So how do we get the flux through that little area patch dA? That little d phi is given by E dotted into dA. In other words, E times dA times the cosine of the angle theta between the normal vector and the electric field. But dA times the cosine of theta has a geometric interpretation. That's the projection of dA onto a tangential surface element, in other words, an area patch on a sphere of radius big R, where R is the distance to the area patch. But we already know this can be projected back to any smaller sphere and the flux calculation will come out the same. So using this projection idea, every flux contribution over the surface S can be mapped onto a tiny sphere surrounding Q with Q at the center. And the total flux through the convoluted surface is the same as the flux through the tiny sphere, which we already know is q over epsilon zero. So we conclude the flux through any closed surface containing q is always going to be q over epsilon zero, regardless of the shape of the surface or the location of the charge within the surface. Notice here that we're using a circle on the integral, indicating that the integral must be taken over a closed surface for this to be true. In other words, to guarantee that 100% of the field lines are captured by the surface. Now we have one more generalization to make. We look at the case of a charge distribution, so n charges q1 through qn, and these are contained in some arbitrary closed surface S, and we want the electric flux through that surface. So we can visualize a small area patch dA on the surface, and the electric field at that location might look something like this. And it's important to note that the electric field there is a superposition of contributions from all the point charges inside the surface. In other words, we just add all the field contributions from Q1 through Qn vectorially to get that total electric field at the area patch dA. So we can write down our flux integral, that's the integral of E dot dA over the entire closed surface. 
but the electric field vector there is a superposition of all the contributions from the individual charges. So we can rewrite that as a vector sum of all of those field contributions. Now recalling that the dot product is distributive, we can break this integral apart. So now we can write it as n separate integrals of e dot dA, where each of those e's is the contribution just from one of those point charges. But each of these integrals is now a flux integral for the flux generated by a single point charge, and we already have a solution for that. It's given by the size of that charge divided by epsilon zero, regardless of the surface or the location within the surface. So every one of those integrals reduces to a qi over epsilon zero. So I have q1 over epsilon zero all the way to qn over epsilon zero. And we can factor out the one over epsilon zero. And we realize our total flux is given by the total enclosed charge inside this surface divided by epsilon zero. And we usually use a subscript of ENC for enclosed total charge inside the surface. So finally, this is Gauss's law. The integral over a closed surface E dot dA is equal to the enclosed amount of charge inside that surface divided by epsilon zero. Where the circle on the integral again just indicates that we're integrating over a closed surface. But how do we use Gauss's law to compute electric fields? The key point here is that we have to exploit the symmetry of our problem so that the integral of this dot product never actually has to be explicitly computed, as we'll see in the next example. So in our example, we're asked to find the electric field inside and outside a uniformly charged spherical shell of radius r with a total charge of q on it. And the key to using Gauss's law is to exploit the symmetry of the problem by analyzing the flux through a surface for which the electric field is constant and perpendicular to the area elements. And this is called a Gaussian surface. So this problem has spherical symmetry, and we choose to analyze flux through spherical surfaces that share the same center. We'll start outside the charged spherical shell. We draw a spherical surface around the shell, and it has a radius of little r here. And by symmetry, we can see that the electric field has the same strength everywhere along our surface, and it must point radially outward. So we write down the flux integral for this Gaussian surface. So that's just the integral over the whole surface of E dotted into dA. But remembering that E is always perpendicular to dA here, our dot product is again trivial, and we can just write the integral as E times dA. But then again, by symmetry, we know that E must be constant. It's the same for every single patch on this spherical surface because every patch is the same distance from the uniformly charged spherical shell. So that E can be pulled out of the integral as a constant, and we're left with the surface integral of dA, which again just says to add up all the area elements on the entire sphere of radius little r, and we know that the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So our flux integral has decomposed to just e times 4 pi r squared. Now we can invoke Gauss's law, and we say that that total flux must be equal to the enclosed charge inside that sphere divided by epsilon zero. We can now solve for the electric field by just dividing both sides by 4 pi r squared, and we find an expression for the electric field outside this spherical shell. That's Q, the charge on the spherical shell, divided by 4 pi epsilon zero r squared. And this is exactly the same thing as the electric field of a point charge located at the center of that shell. So outside the shell, you can't tell the difference between the electric field of a single point charge at the center versus a uniformly charged shell containing the same amount of charge. Now to handle the field inside the charged shell, we again choose a spherical surface with the same center as the charged shell. And again, we're guaranteed that the electric field, if there is any, must be constant and perpendicular to the surface by symmetry. So we start with our flux integral. We use the fact that symmetry tells us our dot product is trivial here, it's maximized. So I just have the product of magnitudes in that flux integral. And again, by symmetry, E is a constant and can be pulled out of the integral. And again, the result of that area integral is just the area of our Gaussian surface, which is 4 pi r squared. But this time, the difference is that the enclosed charge is zero. So when we invoke Gauss's law, we get the enclosed charge over epsilon zero. And we see that our electric field actually vanishes this time. And we find that the electric field inside of a uniformly charged shell is actually zero. Finally, we can plot the electric field as a function of little r, where little r is the distance from the center of the sphere, and we obtain a graph like this. So we can see in the graph that the electric field is zero all the way from the center of the sphere, where little r is zero, out to a distance of big r, the radius of the spherical shell itself, 
Then the electric field is suddenly going to jump to this point charge electric field that's dropping off like 1 over r squared. So the key to using Gauss's law, again, is the clever choice of a Gaussian surface that exploits the symmetry of the problem so that E is a constant and can be factored out of the flux integral and isolated. To get more practice with Gauss's law, you can click on the playlist at the lower left, or just start the next video on the infinite line charge example at the upper left, and I'll see you there.